Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for what I believe is a postponed all-party parliamentary group the blockchain this evening. Uh, we've got a, a great lineup uh, of guest speakers uh, tonight. Uh, we'll be discussing a, a range of issues, notably around international trade and the relationship between blockchain distributed ledger technology. A uh, time like this, when uh, there's a lot going on in the world and international trade is very much a big discussion point in the UK Parliament. I'm sure there'll be uh, much uh, discussion around how distributed ledger type technologies can both improve international trade, uh, improve security, uh, and really help us improve supply chains and a whole range of other issues. So um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you online tonight. Uh, before I uh, begin the introductions of the speakers, uh, I'm going to hand over to Professor Brigitte Anderson, who's the CEO of the Big Innov Innovation Centre, and uh, also just to say a big thank you to all the team. I hope they're all keeping well and safe during these difficult days. Brigitte, over to you. Thank you very much and also welcome from me. Uh, I also think it's a very exciting event in particular because of the whole globalization that's happening now. We, last year we had meetings on logistics and there we really learned how the growth in transnational companies over the last 20 years have tripled and so has subsidiaries. So this will be very interesting to see what, uh, how that relates to blockchain, also the complexity in terms of the flow of physical goods and services, information uh, flows and uh, relationships has also multiplied many times. So I'm really uh, excited about tonight's meeting to hear about what blockchain, uh, how blockchain can support uh, trade and trade finance. Um, and I also want to say to the guests who might be new tonight that we have the blockchain pavilion where you all have registered for this meeting here. And clearly on the blockchain pavilion, you can see how to watch old meetings and how to get engaged and become a member. Thank you very much. And I will hand back to Martin. Thank you, Brigitte. Uh, thanks so much. And before I introduce the next guest, I just thank all the guests for joining us tonight uh, from different parts of the world. So there'll be at different time zones, etc. Uh, so we're very grateful for taking the time out. Uh, I'd like to first of all introduce Emmanuel Gagné, Senior Analyst in the Economic Research Department at the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and Senior Analyst in Economic Research and Statistics Division of the WTO, uh, where she leads on the work on blockchain and is the author of a recently published book entitled can blockchain revolutionize international trade? Uh, Emmanuel, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and I'm going to hand directly over to you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak uh, at this event uh, and delighted to speak on a topic of great interest to me, which is the digitalization of, uh, of trade. Uh, now, we all know that international trade in goods has actually seen very little innovation since the invention of the container in the 50s. Um, now, the containerization cut freight transportation costs drastically uh, by removing the need for repeated handling of parcels, but it did very little to cut bureaucratic processes and paperwork. And international trade today uh, continues to rely very heavily on paper. If you want to ship a container of roses or avocados from Mombasa to Rotterdam, it can generate a pile of paper that is 25 centimeters high. And the cost of handling this container can actually exceed the cost of moving the container itself. Now, very good, we're mentioning uh, the complexities of international trade transactions and the number of actors. Indeed, there are many actors involved in international trade. If you want to, uh, to do a single letter of credit transaction, for example, there are about 20 different players on average, 10 to 20 documents, 5,000 data field interactions, but only 1% of these 5,000 data field interactions actually creates value. So international trade is full of frictions. It's full of inefficiencies. There are about 4 billion paper documents generated as a result of trade activities, and they could go on. So we can certainly do better than that. And this is where blockchain and distributed ledger technologies come in. Blockchain and DLT open unique opportunities in my view to remove frictions from international trade. And it could actually well be as transformative for international trade as the container, if we get it right. Now, why and how can it transform international trade? Because it allows for real-time interaction on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. It allows all actors to, to interact on a single platform in a highly secure environment. 
and it allows no uh, double spending. And I will come back to this issue in a, in a couple of minutes. Now, I would say there are two main applications of blockchain or ODLT in trade. First, it can enhance transparency into how goods are being processed for three different purposes. First, to increase transparency for the consumers and to build consumers' trust. So if you go to, to a store and you want to buy processed ham, for example, there is very limited information on the packaging. But with blockchain, you can really have end-to-end -end transparency. Blockchain allows you to have greater visibility on how that ham got processed, by whom, whether it meets certain environmental and ethical standards. Second, it makes it easier to prove the authenticity of products and to fight counterfeits. And there are a number of luxury brands, for example, like LVMH, that are using it to that effect. And so it can actually help also customs officials to prove prima facie evidence of infringement. Third, because it allows to quickly track tainted products. And you have big retailers like Walmart, for example, that are using it on, on their production lines to quickly track tainted products. So this is the first big use case of blockchain in international trade. The second big use case is uh, when it comes to digitization of trade documents, like the bill of lading, for example, or the digitalization of trade processes to enhance the efficiency of processes such as trade finance, transportation and logistics, and one of the previous speakers mentioned it, or customs clearance. Now, in 2019, I did a survey of some 200 actors in the field with the Trade Finance Global as part of a study that we were doing. And we asked them about the key benefits that they saw um, with blockchain in the trade area. The first benefit was greater transparency between all the parties. The second was gain in speed and efficiency. The third was real-time audio of transactions. And the fourth one, cost reductions. But there's another very important benefit when it comes to uh, trade documents, which is no double spending. And this is critical because you don't want a bill of lading, for example, which is a, a key document, trade document, because it proves ownership of the goods. You don't want that document to be duplicated or to be copied. Uh, if you simply scan it, this is actually likely to happen. And uh, there are a number of fraud cases that have happened, um, including very recently in, in Singapore in the commodity sector, that show how critical it is to ensure that there is no double spending. And blockchain allows you to prove the, the, the authenticity of the origin of the document and to prove that it hasn't been double spent. So there, there have been quite a few DLT projects that have emerged in the trade sphere related to trade finance, be it open account, uh, trade finance, uh, letters of credit, or supply chain finance. In transportation and logistics, there are also a few projects out there that have emerged. The most well-known one is TradeLens, but the, there's now GSBN and a few others as well. Uh, and also quite a few projects when it comes to the digitalization, um, digitization of trade documents and digitalization of trade processes uh, with quite a few um, uh, initiatives there, for example, to digitize the, uh, the famous bill of lading uh, and Today, only 0.1% of bills of lading are actually in electronic format. So there's quite, quite a lot that can be done to improve uh, the, the landscape. Now, I've been um, trying to map the different key projects in the trade sphere uh, with Trade Finance Global. And we issued two periodic tables, the, the most recent one in November last year. And what we've seen is that the number of projects has increased from 29 in 2019 to 44 last year, excluding supply chain finance projects um, and not focusing on the, uh, the traceability issues. And there are more projects related to trade finance and digitization of trade documents. And we also saw that um, the projects have matured. There's a greater level of maturity of all the projects. So this is very good news. But at the same time, what does it show us? It shows us that we have a digital island problem and that this problem is not getting smaller, it's actually getting bigger. So we need to connect the dots. We need to connect the dots at a technical level. And there's already a lot of work being done um, in, the, in the private sector on that, um, on that aspect. We also need to connect the dots at the level of data models. There are a number of data models that already exist um, for some are specific to specific areas like customs, for example, the WCO has a, a data model or for specific documents. Now, sometimes you have many standards. If you look at e-invoicing, there are more than 30 different standards. So it shows that we need to uh, look to develop standards if we want them to succeed, to have critical mass, to be adopted by, by a critical mass, so to have visibility and to gain traction. 
and we need to work at the regulatory level. And I want to insist on that point because I know that I'm working, I'm talking to MPs today. Now, in our latest uh, paper updating the periodic table of DLT projects, uh, we sought to understand the various challenges facing DLT firms as they try to scale up their solution. And it's very interesting to note that the legal challenges were rating as posing a more pressing challenge than any other challenge. So regulators have a key role to play to support the wider deployment of blockchain in trade. It's critical, yet it's very often overlooked. Now you can have a great digital technology, but if you don't have recognition of e-signatures and e-documents, nothing will change. And there are quite a few countries that still do not have that. Or when there's legislation, the practice still needs to evolve. But likewise, transferable records, such as bills of lading, are key critical trade documents and digitizing them is essential to digitalize trade. So the UNC trial Melita provides an international framework to align national laws and enable the legal use of electronic documents of title both domestically and across borders. And so it's a key piece of the trade digitalization puzzle. And according to a recent um, ICC UK study, digitizing transferable documents could generate substantial benefits. It could generate 25 billion pounds in the economic growth, 25% extra as in trade by 2024. So transposing the UNC trial militar is critical to allow for true digitalization of trade and to allow for bills of lading, electronic bills of lading, for example, to be exchanged. Now only three jurisdictions have adopted it, Iran, Singapore, and uh, the Abu Dhabi global markets. But I know that the UK is working on it. The UK Law Commission has been very active on that front. And so I hope that, uh, that the process will be completed soon because without it, digitalization of train will remain a wishful thinking. So the message that I want to pass is that you, the regulators, are the ones who to a very large extent hold the keys to the digitalization of trade. So we need you to make it happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. I, th I think that's going to be quite challenging for a lot of uh, parliamentarians, not only in the UK, but in, in, in other areas as well. But first of all, trying to comprehend distributed ledger technology and then getting a grasp of how its impact on trade, on process, and many of the issues that you spoke about. We'll come back to a QA and a later, because I'm, I'm going to move swiftly on now to Nadia Hurt, Project Lead of Data for Common Purpose Initiative and mm -hmm. Blockchain, the World Economic Forum. Uh, and Nadia leads the forum projects that shape the future of technology governance in data policy and blockchain. Uh, and under Nadia's leadership, uh, deliverables focus on unlocking data and for IR technologies to benefit society while protecting users from risks associated with the data economy. Nadia, can we hand over to you? Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Martin. Hey, everybody. So with uh, the work that I lead at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the Forum, I work with global multi-stakeholder communities on a number of blockchain-related blo projects within supply chain and trade. So much of what I'll be sharing today is based on the work uh, co-designed with these project communities. So in responding to the question, where does blockchain in international trade and supply chain make sense? I want to address the relevance and impact of business models and trust heads on. When that lens is developed, I'll then secondly take a look at the blockchain-based digital identity systems in trade today and the potential that that brings. So more on digital identity and blockchain later in the presentation. First, I want to look at um, sort of many times the elephant in the room, business models and trust. There are many international and supply chain solutions today that are blockchain based, which can be argued should in fact never have been developed with blockchain technology. A centralized model would have sufficed. This is why in thinking about the application of blockchain technology in trade, it's really important to consider business models and trust. Let's face it, for many in the private sector, uh, whether to use blockchain, it's essentially a business model decision. Where is the money? From a business perspective, many wants to own and control through a centralized system. 
So in answering the question of, you know, where does blockchain make sense in trade? It really comes back to a discussion on centralized versus decentralized models. Will platforms and centralized models successful today, one can argue, want to give up their position and invite others into a more centralized model? Many will argue, not always, not really, right? So in general terms, one can say that centralized models are still de facto the way for a private sector to increase the bottom line optimally. However, we have to remember that consumer behaviors are changing to a more value-based buying. So for instance, if you think about blockchain within sustainable supply chains and sourcing, it goes back to the question of whether there is a business case for private sector in sustainability? And can they price a premium where they can prove sustainability through the added transparency that blockchain offers? This very much becomes a question of what specific industry are in, what competitive and other pressures the industry is facing, what your competitors are doing and other things. Of course, regulation is another obvious driving force for enabling sustainable change and introducing blockchain where it makes sense. And we'll, we'll hear later today from every ledger where sustainability, transparency, um, et cetera, is a really good example of where it's been put into practice. Well, what we essentially see today is that many organizations have the decentralized technology, but they have a centralized business model. And then the question becomes, is DLT really necessary? In that context, it's important to remember that many of blockchain's features are not unique to blockchain technology. Encryption, digital signatures, hashing, and so on. It can also be found within centralized systems. And centralized systems, many can say it's easier to set up and you can get some of the same security or other advantages that blockchain offers. That is assuming you trust the centralized party. If you trust the entity running the centralized platform, then there might not necessarily be a case for the immutability feature which blockchain technology brings. So it really depends on who will be running the centralized system. Do we trust that party? With that party's digital signature, do we trust the digital signature? Have they tampered with the record? Was the ledger set up by a trusted organization? Hence, blockchain has an important role to bring that trust where the centralized model does not provide it and where trust is really key and critical to the use case. In taking that centralized versus decentralized perspective through such a lens of business models and trust, I'll now go into more detail on one use case we believe uh, where decentralized technologies make sense in international trade. The forum has done work on this with uh, many of our private and public sector partners. I'll tell you about that a little later. But that's digital identity verification in trade or in supply chains as we also think about it as trustworthy supplier management and verification. So let me bring up a slide here. Um, so identity and trust, as you would know, it lay at the core of each trade intersection, right? An interaction. Questions that needs to get answered today is, what suppliers can I trust? Are these new vendors compliant? And as transactions and deal making becomes increasingly digital, trade entities need to efficiently link a digital identity to a real organization and more importantly, evaluate the trustworthiness of these legal entities. For some of you policymakers, you'll be more familiar with it if you think about it in the world of international trade. This means that organizations incorporated in one participating country as a trustworthy or legitimate business entity would be mutually recognized in another country. I mean, exporters and importers need to rely on alternative and many times new vendors and suppliers overnight during times of disruption as COVID and the vessel that got stuck in the Swiss Canal recently reminded us of. So for policymakers, a global trusted digital identity system 
can be the key to unlocking the trust and agility that is essential to making international trade resilient. But what does it look like today? So if you look on the left, uh, what digital identity verification systems look like in trade today. Supplier verification processes are currently performed in centralized silos. So different public and different private ledgers record, maintain and verify identical identity data and potentially 100 times over. It's not interoperable. It creates a significant amount of redundant information and duplicative efforts. In cross-border transactions, as you would know, there is not one global central party that can verify globally that this person or organization is who they say they are. So today, the whole digital identity verification process is handled very siloed. And as I've said, costly and ineffective. So let's imagine a world tomorrow to the right. If we want a world a global system where there is transparency and visibility globally on digital identity aspects. Where would that system be placed? In the UK, in China, in the US? That's not political feasible to have such a centralized database in any of these one countries. So this is an example of there is a business case to develop systems as a decentralized solution you know, no one owns it or controls it, at, at least not to the extent that you will today with centralized systems. And you wouldn't want the data to be in one central place, but instead decentralized and everybody has a copy of the ledger. It is these kind of scenarios where blockchain makes sense in trade. There is a strong case for blockchain where it is politically important to have control decentralized in situations where it is I would say, again, politically difficult or for other reasons to place a central system and authority in, for example, one country or one region. So this decentralized model in such instances where control is decentralized, no one owns it, at least not in the traditional sense, um, makes, makes sense. And there, um, there within international trade is a value proposition. Another example, and I know uh, some of you on the, on, on the panelists have worked on these, uh, these kind of scenarios as well. Another example is using the same principles of decentralization and trust is where countries want a single view of cross-border transactions and where you actually have the possibilities to link different countries. In single view trade systems today, it is done in a centralized one-to-one -one fashion. But if you want to have a single system across multiple countries, you'll need an integrated infrastructure. And again, the same question, where should it be placed? There, a decentralized system then makes sense where all parties can participate in the validation process and have a copy of the data. To conclude, is there a naturally trusted third party in the industry for the specific use case? If yes, then centralized systems can probably do what you need from decentralized systems, generally speaking. If there isn't a trusted third party for commercial, political, or competitive reasons, then look at decentralization in trade. Quick mention um, for those of you not familiar within the forum, we've published um, over the last uh, two years a number of papers. Uh, on inclusive deployment of blockchain in supply chain. If you want to go and learn more about the digital uh, identity, so trustworthy verification of digital identities that I uh, spoke about today, you'll see the second paper um, is available online. It's built out what a model can look like using a decentralized technologies if we move to a global trade digital identity system. For a country that start thinking about it, you know, you can start thinking about that within your own region or within a few other countries. Um, and we're seeing a lot of uh, similar work being done on the traveler um, side for passenger travel, where they're moving towards uh, better ways to verify um, identities across borders. And then lastly, also, there's a toolkit online, uh, Redesigning Trust Blockchain Deployment Toolkit, where we've put together um, important considerations when you design blockchain solutions in supply chain to make sure that it's well-designed, uh, inclusive, and responsible. Uh, you can find that online. Thank you very much. Nadia, uh, thank you. Uh, and like Emmanuel, just uh, great information that you're sharing with us there today. I think one of the aspects that 
kind of got me there was a decentralized system and from a political perspective in a rules-based order i think then uh, given the world in which we live in today that's a might be a bit of a challenge but i'm looking to hear more from questions maybe on that subject in in just a, a couple of minutes time uh let me now progress now to abel marcio director of construction and blockchain consortium uh, as an architect and senior research associate at university college london as a founding director of construction a blockchain consortium and faculty member of UCL Centre for Blockchain Technologies. Recently, the consortium has published the white paper Blockchain Construction and Construction Cash Flow. Uh, Abel, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. And uh, yeah, I'll be talking about today's uh, white paper we've uh, recently published. Uh, just checking if you can see my screen. Um, so uh, briefly, I'll uh, talk a little bit about myself. Uh, uh, as Martin said, I'm uh, Dr. Abel Maciel, a senior research associate at University College London. And uh, I do mainly three things. Uh, so I have my uh, knowledge platform called designcomputation.org and this deals with computational design in all its complexities and it's directed to the build environment. Uh, we uh, have the Construction Blockchain Consortium at uh, UCL since uh, 2018. And I'm also the Linux Foundation Hyperledger uh, academic member at UCL. And at UCL, I look mainly at uh, design and choice and uh, choice modeling. And uh, I investigate uh, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, human computer interaction computer supported collaborative design, uh, build information modeling, but also game theory and behavior modeling and the distributed leisure technologies like blockchain. Uh, the consortium uh, has been initiated in 2018 uh, and uh, we aim to um, uh, support knowledge transfer, arrange commercial and academic presentation, assess and test commercial services and technologies and conduct research and drive policy regulations and the understanding of this radical uh, technology and its application in the construction uh, industry. Where required, we also develop a proprietary technology and services for the consortium members, use both outside contractors and leveraging PhD and master students at UCL and other institutions uh, affiliated to the consortium. Those services might include a number of things, including consultancy, but also support to new, new ideas and startups, et cetera. So the consortium uh, is preoccupied with uh, the, the, the fact that uh, we have a, a mandated use of uh, build information modeling in the UK. And, and this is uh, a, a great initiative from the government. But uh, now with uh, the, uh, you know, development of building information modeling, we're starting to see that it's becoming more a project management tool and a very powerful project management tool. So on the top of a geometry specification and, si and simulation that happens in the building information model, we also have a management tech emerging. So we have analytics on that model that drives uh, procurement in construction. And then we're starting to see the emergence of a layer, a FinTech layer so financial uh, automation uh, and also a low tech. And eventually we expect to see a layer of a gov tech on, uh, on the use of uh, and the implementation of BIM in projects. So we, we want to deal with all of this and the one key technology for all of this to happen and have this vertical integration between those different layers is a blockchain because blockchain uh, helps on uh, everyone being on the same page and everybody uh, looking at the same data. It guarantees the provenance of uh, digital assets, but also guarantees uh, the immutability of a certain assets once a package has been completed, etc. So we expect to implement and evolve um, uh, the ISO 19650 and other standards, uh, also cybersecurity standards. So we've been working hard to uh, publish white papers. Our first white paper has been published uh, in the end of uh, 2020 in our conference. And uh, this is uh, what I'll be discussing a little bit in more detail today. 
and I'm currently uh, working with colleagues to publish our build information modeling and management and computer supported collaborative design uh, white paper in relation to blockchain. And this takes in consideration the digital twin and, uh, and uh, pre-construction and construction and, and occupancy and operations uh, of that digital twin. You can access all papers on our website, constructionblockchain.org, white papers. And uh, on this uh, blockchain and construction cash flow white paper, we discuss five main points, which are, which are the nature of a finance and construction, uh, features of blockchain. Uh, we give a, a very brief introduction of uh, how blockchain can be relevant to the construction sector and the, the disruption and applicability of blockchain, the application analysis. Uh, and indeed, we've uh, uh, reviewed most of the reports, blockchain reports out there uh, in relation to construction. And we have a set of recommendations. So we do uh, investigate some challenges, uh, some opportunities for improvement. Uh, and uh, we uh, also explore this prospect of, uh, of having a new toolkit uh, for the construction industry to aid build information modeling. So we have uh, a set of recommendations mainly three uh, uh, challenges that we've identified. Uh, they are mainly related to culture and cultural change in the construction industry. This is very, very key. So uh, BEAM is a reality. Uh, the construction industry is adopting BEAM and the construction industry is becoming more efficient, but we do have some uh, resistance in the adoption of technology. And uh, this can be something that uh, is not only uh, the, the issue of the industry not wanting to adopt the technology is also the technology can be quite inaccessible and difficult to learn, diff difficult to adopt because there's a very steep learning curve. And this is something that uh, I explore with uh, software publishers like Autodesk and Bentley Systems to understand how the technology can be uh, more accessible to all tiers of the construction sector. Also, there is a... Um, so uh, different uh, geographic jurisdictions that we need to take in consideration when we're talking about uh, embedding blockchain in build information models and uh, using this to assist cash flow. In terms of uh, a roadmap and uh, recommendations we have, uh, in this paper we discuss uh, automating and accelerating payment and also automating accounts in general uh, using blockchain in construction. Uh, uh, we uh, discuss in project oversight and interplay of cash flow and uh, in project oversight of project finances and uh, auditability. And this is quite key. And uh, how we can make sure that uh, uh, a project account is being used correctly and uh, how this cash flow can be executed with no hiccups and no problems. Uh, and also in the longer term, we talk about the complex financials because we start to talk about smart contracts. Uh, with the new blockchains, we can script very complex smart contracts that can actually address law and can uh, 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 automate law. And then with this, uh, we have uh, uh, the possibility to uh, validate uh, the project in a far more effective way. We can uh, start to address uh, variations, delay, uh, delay of time and uh, time mitigation, et cetera, liquidated damages and automated dispute resolution and automated uh, procurement via the BIM. So um, the, the process in the, in the consortium, generally speaking, is that uh, every year we plan to publish a paper. We are now working on our second paper, as I mentioned before. And uh, next year, we start to work on the IoT, you know, Internet of Things and operations. Uh, and uh, once the uh, white paper is published, so we will start to work uh, on a yellow paper, which is a technical paper that will detail this in, uh, in a more technical way. So uh, this can be then used in an open source technology project for the industry. And uh, the open source technology projects are addressed via our hackathons and our technical team. And uh, the idea is that also uh, this will lead to a green paper where we will address sustainability and the impact of blockchain in the construction sector from the perspective of uh, sustainability. 
So if uh, I would say if you are interested in, uh, in this, uh, we'll be uh, running our second conference uh, in October this year. This is a peer reviewed conference. And uh, uh, we will be discussing our second white paper on build information modeling and um, blockchain. And also cross referencing this with our previous paper on uh, uh, blockchain and, and construction cash flow. And uh, I would invite you to participate and be involved. So we are based at uh, the Bartlett uh, School of Architecture in Bloomsbury. And uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, this is useful for the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abel. And that's very interesting. Uh, I, before I entered into Parliament, I was in local government in Scotland. So for me, the idea about construction isn't just about the private sector. It's how you might be able to sell distributed ledger te technology to the public sector in a lot of its huge, sometimes massive construction projects, uh, which have a profound impact on, on people's lives. So thank you so much for that. And we'll come back to you during the Q&A. Uh, finally, and I'm delighted to welcome Esther Torum, who's uh, Chief of Staff uh, at Everledger and uh, who's uh, the force multiplier, some would say, and strategic thought partner. Uh, to uh, Everledger CAO and executive team, uh, has 20 years of experience across investment banking and business management. Uh, Esser is part of the executive team for the Diversity and Inclusion Network at the CFA Institute, uh, where they play an active role to help increase diversity across professional services. Esser, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And could I hand over to you? Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, as Martin said, my background is very much financial services. Um, and of course, since I joined Everledger three years ago, it's been very much around supply chain. Uh, so my views are a combination of both. Um, Everledger is digital transparency company. Uh, we are a digital transparency company. So we apply blockchain and complementary other technologies like uh, artificial intelligence uh, and, and smart labeling uh, to enable transparency and traceability across complex supply chains. Um, yeah, as Nadia mentioned, sustainability is very much core part of our proposition uh, to increase sustainable to footprint of the supply chains we look after. And we have a multi uh, vertical, multi asset uh, model where we basically uh, operate uh, across uh, luxury products, uh, also circular economy applications like plastic, electric vehicle batteries, etc. Um, we believe blockchain is transformative for international trade, uh, and that ultimately comes down to three main qualities of blockchain. It's a decentralized, distributed uh, system. Uh, that enables that peer-to-peer -peer trust, um, as, as the fellow um, speakers explained. Uh, high security and immutability data of the data is very much the center of, uh, of, that, of, of that proposition. So it is temper-proof data, it is time spent, and it is real by all, shared by all participants real time. And the last part is automation, uh, which is very much enabled by smart contracts. Um, and smart comp co contracts are not contracts at all. They are just computer programs uh, that are conditioned to self-execute when, uh, when certain basically uh, uh, con conditions are met. met. I'd like to bring it to, to reality. I know it can be quite uh, theoretic and high level. Uh, so this is uh, one of our industry lines, uh, electric vehicle batteries at the top part of the screen where you see the linear uh, supply chain uh, where of course um, several different participants ge geographically spread all around the world uh, communicate uh, via central systems uh, in order basically to get the battery from uh, to mine to, uh, to the user. Um, so what we do basically put the blockchain um, 
as a as a um, centralized system where all basically parties communicate with each other via the centralized system and not only the supply chain in in a linear fashion but we can also bring the certificate agencies or or auditors basically that create extra um, extra security or, or, or extra checks and balances to the system. So that linear model in a very simplistic way of, of describing this becomes more circular, where parties basically can exchange information in a secure way, in a time efficient way, uh, and in an immutable environment with each other. And, and the traceability and transparency of that data, of course, enables all participants to act in the, uh, in, in the best interests of, of, the, of the supply chain in general. So when we apply this logic uh, to uh, trade finance, is, is we are very much experts in mapping uh, supply chains. That's what I've done. I basically mapped the international trade workflow and then identify multiple areas where uh, these characteristics, these three characteristics of blockchain that I mentioned can benefit to the system. So trade finance very much comes at the top of my list and of course very core to my, uh, my previous experience as well. And, and I got this picture actually from Imanuel's book uh, where only trade finance basically um, transaction uh, is, is pictured and it is <laughs> it's absolutely um, brilliant picture, I think, to show the complexity across different players, different documents, different data elements, just uh, for a single trade finance transaction. And that resonates a lot. Uh, in my previous career in banking in 2016, we experimented to apply blockchain uh, on a trade finance transaction, it's 100,000 data products transaction. And from end to end, we managed to reduce the whole process from seven to 10 days to four hours. Um, and um, that was, of course, a major breakthrough. Uh, we thought in many ways, uh, considering you know, lots of time and, and, and effort invested in that, but unfortunately it couldn't scale. Uh, I'll come to that later on, but I've done uh, the mapping in terms of identifying different areas uh, across the international trade uh, where blockchain can help. Uh, Imanuel brilliantly talked about the paperless trade. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, and very much cost savings goes with that as well. Um, so I think it was World Economic Forum that thought at least 30, 40% cost saving could be achieved um, in international trade via blockchain. Intellectual property is absolutely a key area uh, where uh, that traceability uh, would certainly help the counterfeits in the space and would protect the IP in the right way. Uh, provenance sustainability, I think I talked enough, which is our very much our core proposition, uh, not to only enable traceability, but also enable small and medium sized uh, enterprises uh, to be part of the um, trade finance, uh, uh, sorry, international trade, uh, where they're, they don't currently get access to, to financing. Um, and I think in the national context, I certainly see the benefit of interagency coordination as well. A um, few other uh, areas uh, around certification and licensing, as I mentioned in the electric vehicle example, uh, customs, another one in terms of reducing reliance of manual verification. Identity management, again, not yet brilliantly explained. I completely agree. Um, and even uh, some simple things uh, like temporary admission of goods when, uh, for example, a museum exhibition uh, takes place and the goods arrive to the, to the country, uh, things can be much simpler uh, if, if it is managed uh, in, a, in a paperless and more efficient way. So I'd like to come back why our experimentation in uh, um, trade finance couldn't scale, uh, mainly because there wasn't enough legal and regulatory framework uh, to authenticate or to provide enough uh, confidence uh, on the e-documentation. 
uh, and especially in terms of defining liabilities and in when it comes to smart contracts, certainly uh, there, there is a big gap and bank, banks need that confidence in order to scale uh, blockchain applications. There is currently some, some work taking place uh, and, and again, uh, World Trade Organization is, is very much uh, involved in uh, implementing these aspects, uh, but there is still a lot of gap in terms of getting to where we need to. Um, interoperability is going to be a tricky one, although we have been part of some experimentations in the context of Australia-Singapore Free Trade Agreement to apply blockchain it's still a marginal implementation. Uh, otherwise, between import and exporting countries, there's not enough standardization. And that comes back to, that brings me to my last point around data simplification and standardization, which is continuously an issue for us uh, when we ingest data across different supply chains um, in every ledger. And the way we manage that is again smart contracts. So we don't standardize everything, every single industry in terms of data. Uh, but what we do, uh, we map existing formats and enable smart contracts to grab the data that really matters for our um, for our reasons. I think for me, one key thing that to, to talk about, which is perhaps the elephant in the room, is the growth in decentralized finance. And this is certainly uh, highlighting the urgency of us coming together today and why we have to look at uh, blockchain uh, very closely. Um, decentralized finance is, is very much uh, an evolving concept. Uh, it's basically executing financial transactions without a bank or brokerage or exchange in the middle and certainly no regulatory oversight. It's already 20 billion uh, and the growth is more than 700% since 2020. And the potential is enormous uh, because of, of course, the potential of blockchain uh, I talked about. Uh, but the risk can be enormous as well, because there is no accountability when something goes wrong. Um, and these organizations usually operate globally, uh, therefore it is very, very difficult to regulate or put standards around that. Uh, and that's exactly the reason uh, I think regulators, government and policymakers have to embrace blockchain uh, and bring the uh, technological expertise to the picture to basically define uh, what is the best way uh, to involve blockchain in the, um, in the in the mainstream use cases. And I think another critical uh, point is really to look into the standardization and legal policy issues by bringing all the stakeholders together. Um, Cross-country engagements, I know it's ongoing, but uh, would, would very much welcome, of course, to more uh, practical implementations and more visible to that work. And lastly, I'd like to mention about the society, so in impact on society, uh, usually um, the big innovations uh, can create high complexity uh, and confusion in the society when it comes to uh, important values like trust uh, and, and current governance tools won't be effective to manage that impact on society uh, when we are when we basically start when we are serious about implementing uh, a radical technology like blockchain uh, in, in, in the context of international trade and, and otherwise. So having that trust governance framework is absolutely critical when we look at the broader implementation of blockchain. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, to force with there. And I'm always concerned when someone mentions the word logic, because it always makes me think of Mr. Spock in Star Trek. He always says, oh, logic offers a sense serenity humans seldom experience. Uh, and take my word for it, most politicians find the notion of logic very <laughs> difficult. Um, and also, I thought it was very interesting when you finished there, you talked uh, about societal issues because your example at the beginning of, of the miner and the cobalt, the big question uh, I think I, I would hope for many parliamentarians and legislators is what's the impact 
uh, on the miner who's doing the mining? You know, what's the long term impact on society? So thank you very much for that. I've got some very interesting questions uh, and I'm going to go to them first, maybe before I come back to the panel who are here with us today. Uh, I'm just going to go uh, for one. Um, and it's from James Patterson, who's wondering what are the benefits uh, for small and medium players to join such blockchain platforms, usually managed for the most prominent players? Um, Esther, why don't we go to you first? Yeah, it, it's a great point, and I, I touched upon on that. You know, I touched on that in my presentation, but probably didn't do enough uh, justice. Uh, it, it's transformative for uh, uh, for small businesses. Uh, you mentioned Martin about the miners, and and certainly, you know, like all the traders along the some of the supply chains we deal with. Uh, including diamonds, gemstones. Uh, we see real life stories day in, day out from these small, um, small basic providers in the, in the supply chain who are often squeezed uh, in, in the busy uh, supply chain uh, to, to make relevance or, or to get basically enough return for the value they generate. Uh, and enabling basically giving them a voice uh, via tra traceability and transparency is, is certainly uh, not only uh, important ethically, but it creates business sense as well, uh, because these people usually do not have access to right financing or, or even payments uh, facilities uh, just because uh, they, they cannot ma satisfy you know, some of the high bank criteria uh, when it comes down to identity or, or security. Um, and you know, enabling basically them to have access uh, to these um, facilitators, these enablers, uh, via basically giving them traceability uh, and voice, um, you know, and in, in basically showing what what value they are creating to the supply chain and creating whole that give back um, exercise is is very much uh, key of of a uh, key of the technology. Yeah, thank you. I'm maybe wondering if Emmanuel, from a WTO perspective, uh, how that you know with the thinking within the WTO about how it impacts those small medium-sized businesses but also as I mentioned earlier the miner who's mining the cobalt who doesn't have access to decent payment and decent financing. Yeah I mean the question of financing is a, is a very important one uh, I mean MSMEs um, they're the backbone of the world economy it's like 96 96% of companies worldwide, but their participation in international trade is very limited and they face great challenges accessing finance, in particular trade finance. And where I think blockchain can help is uh, in two respects. First, um, as I said, international trade is full of frictions, full of inefficiencies because it's still very paper intensive. And there, there are some studies out there that show that uh, if you remove uh, these inefficiencies, it would actually cut costs and could benefit the small players to a great extent. The ICC UK study I mentioned um, during my intervention ex estimates uh, that um, it could, because of the, the, the reduced costs um, of digitalization of trade documents, it could um, lead to a 25% um, growth in, uh, in MSME's trade by 2024. So this is quite, uh, quite significant. And uh, another number that they have is that uh, it could lead to a 35% improvement in business efficiency for MSMEs. Um, so I do think that the efficiencies that uh, blockchain DLT can bring uh, when it comes to international trade, because there are many players involved, many documents, if we manage to have these different stakeholders interact on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, and uh, if we manage to streamline processes by having data models, we're not there yet, but hopefully that will happen one day, then it could greatly benefit uh, MSMEs. So that's the first thing. The second way in which I think blockchain can really help MSMEs is when it comes to access to finance, in particular trade finance. Uh, there's a huge trade finance gap, 1.5 trillion. Uh, most of it affects MSMEs. And most of MSMEs that do not have 
um, that do not find funding uh, for, for their trade activities, uh, in more than 40% of the cases, they don't find any source of funding. So they, they basically cannot trade. And why do they find it difficult to access trade finance? Uh, for a number of reasons, that, uh, some of them are because they lack credit history. Uh, now, blockchain can help them build that credit history because you have the immutability of blockchain and the traceability. And you have some platforms that have been put in place uh, that use blockchain technology to allow MSMEs to build that credit history and then access easier financing, have fast track trade, for example, in mind, which is based in Singapore. Uh, second, very often banks will require extra collateral from uh, MSMEs and they don't necessarily have the ability to provide that collateral. Um, and the fact that all the KYC AM, uh, AML processes can be very costly. Now, blockchain can help facilitate those processes, reduce costs, and therefore make it easier, hopefully, for banks to, to lend to, uh, to, to MSMEs and to give them access to, to trade finance. So I think in, when it comes to trade finance, there are some great benefits that MSMEs um, can derive uh, from uh, the, the implementation of blockchain in that space. And uh, I, I would say, uh, in answer to, to the question that was asked, that um, some of the platforms uh, that have been put in place specifically target the MSME sector um, when it comes to trade finance, and I have we trade in mind, uh, they launched their project specifically to help MSMEs get easier access to trade finance. So they are not only these these big players that do not that only think about themselves and not about MSMEs. No, you do have a number of blockchain platforms that have been developed to uh, to help MSMEs. Thank you. So I do think it, it does present interesting opportunities. Okay, um, Abel, can I come to you about? How that then reflects on construction uh, and smaller medium-sized construction companies for example uh, and how the technology will allow them to access uh, contracts uh, and can do you I mean I think in my former uh, uh, local government role of contractors constructing roads building schools uh, you know to me that's a large contract but for many in the kind of global market it's you know it's minuscule so where does that impact them in terms of the, from your perspective, from architectural perspective, where does it impact them? Right, yes, I, I think this is uh, an important point because uh, architects, engineers, and other you know, highly specialized, highly educated consultants in the construction sector have access to, to time, to the technology and to time to learn the technology and apply the technology in complex, in complex projects. For example, I've done lots of work for Zaha Hadid Architects, uh, you know, modeling complex double curve geometry and complex surfaces, you know, projects like uh, the Olympic swimming pool and so forth. Not particularly that project, but similar to that project. You know, very complex geometries that had back then to be delivered in beam level two, uh, have to be fully federated, integrated with a team using uh, using um, that sort of technology. Uh, the technology is not easy to learn and, uh, and I find very hard to believe that a tier three contractor will be using complex beam uh, and uh, federated uh, building information models to deliver uh, what they do. I, I think the way blockchain can help is uh, nowadays, every single contract I've seen uh, carry, a, they all carry a smartphone on their pockets and they can take pictures, they can communicate, and this can be blockchain through apps and other mechanisms using, you know, feeding data into a, the blockchain. And this eventually can be linked back to the uh, build information model. It can be used in, uh, in automatic payment if, uh, if uh, a smart contract allows for that in the blockchain. So I do believe it's an entry point. I do believe that um, uh, we are also seeing blockchain itself evolving. There are, you know, uh, all the distributed ledger technologies like a block that, that are very lightweight and consume very little energy, and they can be very useful for construction processes uh, that are enabled by build information models, by federated models, and uh, and it can also be quite useful for the lower tiers of the construction sector who somehow have to digitalize what they do. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can then link that, Nadia, uh, in terms of 
where the World Economic Forum, for example, thinks about the end user, because uh, uh, Sirius Loharabs put up a question around how does blockchain assist uh, stakeholders, including end users, uh, the consumer in e-commerce product traceability? Um, you know, to example, to prove that the that the product is genuine. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so let's take a simple example that we all can relate to. Think about uh, parts of your car, automotive uh, parts, components, right? And you see a lot of recalls happening for safety issues. And that, of course, is an extremely important um, piece where you need to have accurate information of where that part came from, etc., because passengers' lives can, can be at stake. If you think about uh, importing automotive components, then what would you trust more? Would you trust a centralized system that's just information from the four walls? And we have a history of some automo automotive companies telling different stories of what went down. Or will you trust more information where there's multiple parties that can verify and can um, speak to that information and the transparency and the accuracy of that? So there's a higher accountability when you have to share information with an end consumer where you have a ledger distributed and you have multiple parties being able to verify if that's indeed an accurate account. Now, whether that's an accurate account is subject to a number of things, but it increases the accountability for the end consumer. The issue becomes the, the end consumer education. The issue becomes application, user-friendly applications, right? And again, how do you monetize and how do you commercialize these, these systems? But, um, but there's absolutely an increase in accountability. When you talk about environmental tracking, uh, your global carbon footprint of a company, if you can get multiple players uh, across the supply chain and the value chain report on what their um, uh, shared truth is, that shared truth just has a much a likelier, highlyhood, high, higher likelihood of being accurate and increases the transparency. Can I, can I then take that just a little bit further uh, with you, Nadia, in terms of, um, as I mentioned earlier on about efficiencies, I maybe wanted to try and relate those efficiencies through blockchain type technology to improved services. As a politician, um, as a legislator within a democracy, and I'm looking to sell a type of technology, I'm looking to sell not just for efficiency, but an, an improvement in services, whether it be in the private sector or for yes. my critically in the public sector. How, how, do we, how do we do that, get that notion of- improvement? Very important, very important. And we actually are working on a number of projects with a number of governments around the world on exactly that public goods delivery and how do we build uh, open infrastructure uh, technology to enable data sharing beyond, um, yeah, reusing the same data so you actually can get a lot of more good out of public good. And that is where you can look at data. At the end of the day, this all comes back to data. Data being the new oil, et cetera, et cetera, what we can do with data. If you look at data through the blockchain lens, then there's a few interesting things for the practitioner about blockchain. The privacy preserving techniques, technologies that blockchain offers, they, it has some unique privacy pre preserving technologies. Yes, it's not always efficient. Yes, there's still a lot of innovation that needs to happen. Um, another thing with blockchain, if you think about who has the right to data, who owns data, a huge problem for us today. And for if you think about public goods, what are you allowed to use data for? Can you use it for this purpose? Can you use it for that purpose? Blockchain allows you to give consent, track the digital rights management, not to go to NFTs. That's not, but, but if you think about how it enables you to provide differentiated permissioning so that I can say, as Nadia Hewitt, I'll give my data to you for COVID uh, research or dementia or for uh, elderly care one day so you can develop a customized elderly care, but I will not share my data for these and these and these reasons. So you're giving me control. Blockchain has a way there to, with tokenization, with smart contracts to help automate and to do things that were not possible before when you talk about permissioning, uh, consent, and things. So for me, it's like, we can't just look at blockchain as this one thing. You need to start thinking about the features that blockchain offers and what it helps you do together with these other technologies that were not possible before, but absolutely critical in an infrastructure for public goods, public services, etc. If you think about what some of the, the technology brings. Thank you. I, I maybe if I 
maybe come Emmanuel to you again trying to link that to international trade we've heard about the utilization of blockchain technology between Singapore and Australia and there, there will be parliamentarians maybe watching tonight who'd be concerned about oversight of those types of processes uh, about the governance model of that again as we're talking about the public good um, how how do we sell blockchain type technology in international trade negotiations to people like me sitting in a parliament but what what is the you know what is the benefit of it great question i've been trying to say it for the past three years talking to trade officials <laughs> and yes i mean it's it's not easy because the, the world of blockchain is, is complex we say blockchain yes but there are many different uh, distributed ledger technologies that have their own uh, their own features their own characteristics um and so it's not it, it's it's not a, a homogeneous world. Uh, you have some uh, public platforms, uh, private platforms, consortium permission, permissionless, etc. So it's it's a very very diverse landscape. Um, but what I think is important for uh, for regulators to understand is how whether it's it's public or, or permissioned, it's the potential that the technology has to make trade processes more efficient because it allows the different stakeholders which uh, who for the moment interact in silo have their own uh, registries uh, to interact in a, in a highly secure environment on a peer-to-peer -peer basis in a highly trusted environment. Uh, Nadia mentioned that. Um, and th this is critical because this is how we can remove frictions from international trade. Um, so I think what is important is to, to see where it makes sense to use that technology. And uh, as I mentioned, a number of areas uh, where it makes a perfect sense in terms of, of, of trade finance, uh, how it can help um, for, for customs processes, et cetera. Um, and where the regulators come in is to provide the, uh, the enabling regulatory environment to allow the technology to actually make a, a difference and to be used to, to, to its full, full potential. Uh, because right now, we don't have that regulatory framework. Uh, some countries do. You mentioned Singapore. Singapore is ahead in, in many respects, uh, has put in place the UNC Trilimility R that I was mentioning in my opening remarks, uh, has transposed it at the national level. Uh, but it's not the case of a number of other jurisdictions. Now, you need to be two to tango. Right. Uh, so we can really make a difference for international trade if more jurisdictions transpose the UNC Trilimility R and put in place a regulatory framework that, uh, that can allow the private sector and government entities to use the technology um, and to have this uh, recognition of electronic transferable records to be able to share those documents, to pass them on. I was mentioning the, the e-bill of lading. Um, so this is, I, I think, really where the, the role of regulator, uh, regulators come in. Uh, but the evidence uh, is, is there when it comes to, to trade finance. Uh, of, for example, of the uh, the efficiencies uh, that the, the technology can bring to, to cut costs. Um, it, it's a matter of building the right ecosystem. And um, this is why I think it's critical for regulators to work with the private sector hand in hand to try and and find the solutions to uh, to move ahead. Thank you. And maybe uh, just to uh, Abel, if I could bring you in um, around trust, um, you know, James Parsons asking our question about trust and you know saying blockchain relies on you know that the openness you know the transparency element and sharing information with partners. So how is blockchain really you know is it really is it not about he says removing trust? I think it's maybe about putting trust among partners or will increase the need for it to uh, the need uh, to implement the technology to give that trust because they don't take up the technology they're never going to have that trust. Right. Yeah. So yeah, blockchain. I think everyone's honing in on this one, and somebody else is, but uh, we'll get there eventually. But sorry, Bill, on you go. Okay. Yeah. So blockchain is a trustless system that allows uh, trust between parties who never trade before uh, with each other. So uh, yeah, it's referred to you know taking away the trust or, or a trustless system, but it's actually uh, you don't need to trust the other party. Uh, to, to trade because blockchain is, is uh, um, taking care of the trust mechanism. Uh, and uh, in the construction sector, this is a, a wonderful thing. Of course, 
there are lots of issues in cash flow and for instance, tendering for buildings, et cetera. And this is something that is very delicate and, uh, and it needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, even if you um, conceal or obfuscate part of the information because you're running a two-stage, three-stage uh, tendering uh, process or, or, or doing something like that, Nevertheless, if the data is blockchain, you, create, you are creating a, a, an accountability chain that can be used in a later stage to double check on all audit uh, processes. So I think this is very useful. Uh, also, uh, uh, in terms of uh, automation and, and trust, uh, people can, it's a very, can be a very simple thing, a very simple change. People can get paid quicker and this in the construction sector is a big deal. Lots of companies go out of business because they don't get paid quickly enough. They, they have to wait uh, 60 days, 90 days. Uh, there are retentions, etc., And uh, this can create a lot of problems. I just wonder if this address your question. Uh, I hope so, because uh, 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 I think it did, yeah. I, I know that Nadia also wants to come in and, and answer a question, then I'll bring Emmanuel in before we try and tie up. Thank you. It yeah, so Tom, uh, so there's been some questions around, do we really need to trace at a component level? I mean, you know, the, the, the benefits doesn't make sense. And are we trying to create an automated how micromanage at an incredible level of detail? So I just want to briefly speak about that because um, I, I worked for years in South China. I've worked in Factory Force Account Asia for many years. I've worked at Maersk and others, and it's happening today. So we had large hundreds, thousands of employees at companies were paying a lot of money to trace to an SKU level, manual work. So for me, the moment I started reading about blockchain, I couldn't stop because I was sitting in Shenzhen pushing out documentation one by one on an SKU purchase order, mixed case level. Um, so it happened. But I want to come back to actually my presentation, which exactly was, it doesn't always make sense. It doesn't always make sense at all. Centralized technologies has a lot of the features, uh, the, the hashing, digital signatures that blockchain has. So it comes back to where is that trust a critical enabler? Where are there, there are commercial reasons? Listen, if this is an Inditex, uh, Zara, $5 white t-shirt that's just being replenished, does it really make sense? Probably not. Um, but if it's something where that trust component is key and you connect to devices, et cetera, will become part of the programmable economy. Yes, and we, we see today that it is already happening. So if you can share ledgers, have a shared truth, um, there's value. I think also in, in, in a very practical sense, a commodity such as food production, uh, which will be uh, vulnerable in so many ways with uh, climate change, uh, and its, its components, etc. That maybe you know, that thing is a, a great example for it. Uh, I know that Emmanuel wanted to come back in briefly as well. Very briefly, because I know that um, that it's getting late. Uh, no, I just wanted to come back to the question of, of trust. Um, where blockchain brings trust is when the different parties um, interact on a, with each other using using blockchain, um, because you have the guarantee that the data has not been tampered with. But I wanted to nuance a little bit um, this uh, enthusiasm around blockchain, because you, you do you do have the guarantee when the data is on chain, but you still need a number of processes off chain to ensure that whatever you, you claim, ethical claims, environmental claims, are actually uh, monitored off chain. Um, there's this famous uh, expression garbage in garbage out you need to make sure that the data that you add to the ledger is of good quality if you really want to, to the, the blockchain to be efficient and, and this trust to be created um, and uh, it can be easy for for diamonds for example because the diamond is unique so you, you scan it and you have the identity of the diamond it can be much more tricky when it comes to i don't know uh, mangoes for example or, uh, or or other products and i think this is a very important thing to uh, to, to bear in mind this off-chain uh, versus on-chain uh, relationship thank you and um, emmanuel i'm just going to ask a, a final question of all the panelists and i hope it's a yes or no answer but i'll start with you emmanuel um, if there is to be standardization, uh, does it require to be based on an international rules-based system? Uh, no. If, if you ask me for yes or no, no. Um, the, the standards will be developed by a number of entities, and it's already the case. But what is important is then to, to have 
um, some standards that have a critical mass that are recognized as the, the standards and that can be used as a, as a reference. But I think uh, one term that I use in my book is smart standardization. I think we need to have uh, some alignments, uh, but not have uh, an approach that is too rigid. Okay, uh, Nadia, what about you? Our international rules-based system process? I don't have much more to add in what Emmanuel has said. Agree. With <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Abel. I. Um, mm, I. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, we have to have uh, uh, a flexible system that they and it, this needs to address uh, uh, local local activities, uh, etc. Uh, it's tempting to say yes, but the reality is. Probably no. Okay, thank you. And Esther? I would say yes, but it's very difficult to achieve. So, um, but yeah, if it is possible, that would make life much easier, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as a, an elected politician, I have to say, I think I'm air more on the international rules-based system myself at the moment, but I know the kind of the flexibility that's required, but uh, I do, I think I maybe agree with Esther on that one. Can I say thank you so much for all of you uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I know that you're all in different parts of the globe and different times of day, uh, and we're really grateful for a very interesting discussion uh, for all of those who have been watching online and asking questions. I'm grateful as always to the other board members, the advisory panel, and also to the team at the big innovation center uh, for everything that they're, they're doing at the moment as well. Uh, Brigitte, would you like to say anything uh, before we head off? Yeah, I thought I also enjoyed the, uh, the discussion very much. Uh, one thing I, I noticed was that many uh, of the speakers in their talks used the word key. So like the regulation is the key, one said, uh, uh, the, the business models is the key, trust is the key, IP is the key, we had a lot of things emphasized as being really important, the key, uh, and that word was used, and that just shows how, when you're framing policy and regulation around, how we know the many keys here, uh, uh, but uh, they're all very important, and I think that's clearly the very challenge of this whole here, is the ecosystem of all these key important areas. Another thing I, I noticed was, uh, and I couldn't help looking at the slide, uh, well, not all of the slides, but the one on complexity, it was interesting. And what we are doing now uh, at the Big Innovation Center is that we're actually mapping the blockchain actors in the innovation ecosystem. We did it in 2018, but we're also doing it right now. Uh, hopefully we'll have it done uh, before uh, the summer reception in July, if we're able to have something like that, or we can do it online with that uh, report. Um, but it's really a report where we are mapping uh, more than 800 UK blockchain companies, the investors in it, the, the blockchain technology they're developing, and uh, who are the ecosystem players in this. So this is really the supply chain we are mapping. So I look forward to uh, present that. And I think this is, uh, this is the, because of the complexity, all this is uh, very, very important. Uh, but I'll hand back to Martin, but I've really enjoyed it and uh, it's all recorded and we're going to uh, be watching it back and I'm sure we'll be writing up the results and taking it further. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Brigitte. And given the fact this was about uh, international trade, we won't be talking about trade agreements in the UK in the post-Brexit world, but <laughs> we've had enough of that at the moment. But it just seems, means to me to say thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us. For those of you watching live and for those who watch later on to the advisory panel for being here tonight and again to all the team at the big innovation center so thank you all so very much and please do stay safe uh, and uh, we'll see you all soon thanks again and good night